Welcome back to the Celtic Soul Podcast with me, Andrew Millen. My guest on the show today will be Willie McStay, who comes from one of the most famous Celtic families around. Willie has every Scottish medal in the cabinet from his time playing at Celtic. As youth and reserve team coach, he produced 21 players who went on to play in the Champions League. I would like to thank our episode sponsor, Left Wing Badges, who produce all our badges, which you will find at our online shop at CelticFanzine.com. You'll also find our t-shirts and other merchandise. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club would like to support the podcast and become a sponsor, please email us at info at CelticFanzine.com. You can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. Best of luck to the Willie Maley Memorial Group in Yuri for their upcoming walk on Sunday to raise funds for a monument to the great iconic Celtic figure Willie Maley. For more information, follow them on Twitter at Maley or you can also follow them on Facebook. Another three points at another empty stadium, this time in Paisley, as Celtic came from a goal down to win 2-1 against St Mirren, who parked the bus for most of the game. We've also narrowed the gap at the top of the table to three points with a game in hand against Aberdeen. Shane Duffy grabbing the headlines again. Duffy is handling headers from set pieces like he is handling the press. He handled the press so well yesterday at his press conference. We all dream of a team of Shane Duffy's, while Gary Breen just dreams of being noticed again. James Forrest has shut up the critics for the time being anyway, with a fantastic headed goal to win the game. Eduard missed the penalty, but all is forgiven because he has hero status. Had Ryan Christie stood up to take the penalty and miss, I fear it would be a different story with the critics on Twitter. We went behind after three minutes and the following morning I saw a tweet from a Celtic fan calling for Lennon's head if we win or lose the league. Shortly after we went behind, three minutes, three effing minutes with 87 minutes left to play. I can only imagine that the fan is young and frustrated at not being able to get the games and has taken his frustration out on Twitter. Maybe if he was at the game, he would have turned around and said to his mates, or just shouted out aloud in the night air, and it would have went unnoticed. Yeah, it must be a young fan, I think. Who knows, only success as Celtic. Because being a Celtic fan now is a lot different than those barren years back in the 90s, when Rangers were dominating Scottish football. And we had the legendary player, Paul McStay, leading us. One of the greatest players ever to grace Celtic Park, and the Celtic jersey. He could have played for any team in the world, at any time during his career, but he was happy to pull on the Hoops jersey when others would have left for riches and success. Paul stuck with us, the fans stuck with Celtic and have reaped the rewards of loyalty with treble after treble, trophy after trophy and we never went bust in our pursuit of becoming the finest team in Scotland and I know you all agree. Yes, it looks like the Rangers have improved and seem to have a solid defence but remember, Eduard broke their heart before and I expect him and the boys to do it again. Let's get behind Lenny and the boys until the end of the season and then we can open the debate on how Celtic move forward to qualify for the Champions League. Until then, we must keep the faith and stay faithful true and true. The name is McStay and Celtic Football Club have been ingrained in the history of Glasgow and the Glasgow Celtic Football Club. Willie McStay and his son John continue to keep the connection between both going to this day. Willie signed for Celtic in 1977 as a schoolboy and made his debut in 1983. He won league, Scottish and Scottish League Cup medals during his playing time and was youth and reserve team coach and is currently part of the very successful scouting and recruitment team. Hi Willie, a very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. How is life now after the lockdowns and are you getting any nearer to normality in your day-to-day work for Celtic? Yeah, but well, first of all, Andrew, thanks for uh, getting in touch with us and you know, speaking to us today. Uh, I'm sure, like you know, the way you've handled things in the the past as well, you'll be looking at you no know, thorough uh, questions and like you no know, making me reflect on on things that you actually forget about as you're you know, you're growing through different phases of your life. Uh, so it's, it's great to reminisce as well. So thanks for that and. Uh, what you said there, like uh, back to no, the mal- mal- normality, really. I'm actually sitting in a you know, a room that I've created now at home because uh, at the moment, like, you know, there's no live football for us to go and see. Uh, we're getting closer to it in terms of uh, being able to go and see live matches to scout the player. And to be honest, that that is the best way to scout. You know, you see more in the game. You see the player off the ball. You see his uh, character. You see if he's a communicator. Just for instance, like a, a centre-back, if you're watching the game 
on the television or a video, you, you don't see because the camera follows the ball. So you don't actually see you know, how he is round about the halfway line, organising, making sure there's a you no know, like a like you no know, a togetherness of the, the players round about him that when there is a counter attack or a transition of the ball that they're alert. On television all you see is the ball and you don't see see them as well. No. And you you know yourself when you you're watching the game, but you can see and feel the defenders pointing, organising, making sure that behind the ball on the transition that they'll be ready for that moment. So also you can you can feel and see like you no know, what a player's like, you know, when the team's winning. Uh, they've got confidence about them, they're springing their step. You can actually see and feel that. And also the reverse, when things are not going well, so are they one that's just trying to do enough or are they, are they a big character that they want to take responsibility and take the ball? So all these things you know, are difficult. Uh, I'm not saying you, you, know, you don't see other things when you're watching uh, you know, videos and, and live games on the TV, but you know, there is that human part that you miss and it's basically around the attitude, the character, and the tactical awareness, you see more of that when you look at the, the live games. So I, well, hopefully you understand you know, what I'm putting across there. Uh, the perfect scenario for me is when you go and watch a live game, you like the player, and then you come back, and then you can watch clips of the player. Sometimes you see little technical things, or little movements that you didn't see in the game. But on the whole, that's the way I like it. Watch a watch player, and then follow, follow it up. And uh, rather than the other way, but at the moment it's where we are, and we have to work this way. And at the moment, this is a little room that we've created as well. And I think I said to you earlier, I've got some memorabilia here. I'm going to, I've painted it. We've got it ready to put the different bits and pieces now that I've collected through my career. Yeah, and I can tell the listeners there's some great memorabilia there. Some great memories really showed me around right back to 1957 with Sean Fallon signing top right up to the present day from Kieran Tierney. And I actually thought you were going to say, well, he showed me a top from 1957 that he played in. No, definitely not. <laughs> but not this is fan. a special one. John, John Fallon has uh, signed, signed it as well and the, pro, the programme's in it as well. So absolutely delighted to have something like that. A, a real memorable achievement and a, a scoreline that's etched in the every Celtic supporter's mind. It sure is, really. Willie, really, um, before we delve into more about the recruitment policy at the club, we've just recruited, I suppose, an experienced international in, in Shane Duffy, a great signing for the club. Was he ever on the radar? You know, you, you had to come up across him as a younger player. To be honest, not really. Uh, I just know, know what he's done. Uh, and obviously, like, no, it's been a fantastic uh, like signing for us. No, it's loan alone for a year in this hopefully historical year for the club uh, with nine in a row in the bag uh, we're looking to go for a quadruple treble uh, with the Scottish Cup still to be played from last season and ultimately ten in a row so he's come in and uh, to be honest you know, Nick Hammond the, the scouting team the manager uh, you know, everybody involved they've, they've got it over the line and got it over over the line now uh, and I think you can see the impact that he made. You know, he, he, he's assured in what he is. He's got a real strength of character, uh, the Premier League uh, experience as well. So coming up here, you no, know, even from the first game, he's not fa- faced by anything. And I actually watched the game, uh, the national game, when he scored the header. And I, I just felt as if you no, know, it's, it's late in the game. They know that the result at that particular time wasn't what they were looking for uh, and when the corner kick was awarded I just said I got we got feeling that this is going to happen he's going to score the goal and uh, he did and you know you could see after the game I think it showed his uh, personality when I was talking earlier there about character he wasn't glorified in, in his goal it was the performance of the team and how you know, they want to do better and to me, you no, know, just listen. And that's before he's walked in the door. But no, he's the right type. He is the right type. And I know people who know Shane, and obviously my connections with Paddy McCourt. You no, know, and the, you no, know, they were singing his praises before. You no, know, we even stepped through the door. And 
said it be a fantastic signing. So when he's came in, he scored a, a great goal, showed leadership qualities uh, against Ross County. And I just like no like everybody other uh, Celtic fan as well, looking forward to seeing him you know, at Park Celtic Park. Because I'm sure he'll thrive in that atmosphere. Yeah, I suppose you know everyone looks towards Scott Brown for the leadership, but you know he's he's another one that can step up there, another leader on the park. I definitely, I think uh, that's what you want. Like, you know, Scott's been unbelievable. You no, know, he's he's record as a captain, but not just you know his performances and it's on the park and off the park, the dressing room. Like, you no, know, he's uh, he's brilliant in in that environment. But the more leaders you've got, the better. And uh, no, with Shane coming in, he's uh, he's hungry for success. He wants to win trophies as well, and you know that'll be the big part of coming here. His love for Celtic, as he's he said, you know, isn't just a token. It's been in the family, and obviously from where he comes from as well. Like, uh, you no know, Celtic are a big, big club, you know, in, all over the world, but in that part of uh, Northern Ireland and Derry, you know, like he's been brought up you know, with Celtic in his mind. And uh, coming in at a special time when you no, know, it could be history being made. It just to me it looks as if he wants to be part of that. Yeah, does when we mentioned Scott Brown, there, does I suppose there's shades of Paul's career at um, Celtic. I know Scott Scott didn't come through the youth system, but he came to us quite young, and you know he's been with us for all oh, those nine titles. And you know, there was a, a wee story I've got a wee like uh, anecdote uh, when Celtic played Boa Vista. Uh, in 2003 uh, I wasn't there I was a uh, under 19 coach uh, with Scotland as well as doing my uh, head of youth at Celtic and uh, Scott Brown made his debut in that game and he went on as a front player and now you can see his career he's come back he's, he's been at Hibs a tremendous number 8 and now he's, he's went from the 8 to the 6th position as well like no that was the start so I remember driving back, sorry, after the game, it was a, an earlier kickoff, and uh, going into the car and going along the motorway uh, past Cumbernauld when Celtic actually scored the goal. So that was two memories of Boa Vista. Like, you no, know, the goal live when I was in the car and going off my head, <laughs> and Scott Brown's debut under 19 as a striker. Well, I, I was lucky enough to be there that night, Willie, really, and uh, my story was a little <laughs> different. <laughs> It Could you great. see then, but he was he was a player like had he got the leader attitude as a young player? Yeah, yeah, you no, know, he was he was fearless as well, like uh, a fantastic athlete. You no, know, he, he was. You know, you talk about pace, endurance. He had all that, and he had the things I spoke about earlier. Actually, about character and desire. You no, know, that's a big part of being a Celtic player. A lot of good players have came to the club and not handled the. Like, you know, the environment, but it's 20, 24 7, and you know, the demand of win, win, win. And you, know, you have to have that. And uh, like, you know, that's Scott's always had that. And he actually had a good uh, youth team at that time at Hibs as well, Derek Riordan and you know, different other players that uh, you know, they, they were a good group. Yeah, Willie, I'm going to take it back now. We, uh, we spoke there about the recruitment. Um, can you talk us through the recruitment policy at the club? and Maybe take the Frimpong case as someone who didn't have to wait too long to get into the team, and also look at the like, talk us through maybe a player that has to go out and loan to get his experiences. Uh, but the, to be honest, Andrew, the, the policy changes uh, in terms of the individual. The, the, the first team scouting is separate from what I do, but we're, we're getting close of bridging the gap. Well, I'm responsible for the academy, and for us, it's about trying to dominate Scotland. Uh, first of all, with the young age groups, uh, we try to uh, be the leading uh, club you know, for re- you know, recruitment, bringing young talent in. And it all starts way back at uh, five-year-old. Between five-year-old and eight, we have development centres. We have three centres uh, in Scotland, one in the central area, uh, one in Glasgow, Tory Glen, and one down in Ayrshire. And from that, we bring players in for a six-week kind of period and it, it's not it, it's, it's a, a situation where if they're doing well they stay in the coaches are giving them uh, advice cards you know, for them to develop to go back to their club because you know, that age group you can't sign the under 11 age group is the first age group that you can sign a club academy Scotland uh, 
what do you call it, registration. So everything up to under 11 is pre-academy and we're very strong there. Uh, and we work and select these kids all the way through, bring them in to under eights and under nines where we create elite groups. They still play with a boys club and come back at, uh, into our training and go through the curriculum. And under 10, we put that together as the team that we're going to move into the Club Academy Scotland or the uh, fixtures as well. But we will put a games programme on for the kids. And the amount of work that's done down there is enormous. It's, uh, and it's you no know, scouts that are out in all types of weather to try and you know, to try and identify on earth the young the young talent. Uh, then from that you're into the academy type uh, situation uh, under 11 and 12 but again a big focus is on the under 12s to get the squad as strong as it can be because they move from their own primary school into the school programme we've got with St Ninians so it's a big jump going from primary to secondary you know, for any kid without moving into a football environment as well. So the curriculum there is good, you no know, coaching and, and uh, workshops and lunchtime, a special program for them that they can uh, do all their education, but also have the training facilities after the after the, the, the school hours. Uh, we used to do sessions in the morning as well, but depending on well, that's changed slightly, we're focusing now on lunchtime and after school. And there's a new facility up there, uh, the 3G pitch as well, which has been a big boost for us. And then from that, they're trying their best to, in, in the recruitment, we're trying to get the best young talent in. But between 13 and 16, it's amazing how they change. Oh, they go through the maturation, the like, oh, growth spurts. And like, oh, one minute you can be looking at one of the, our own players or, or one out at another club and you're saying, Phew. You know, he's got great talent, balance, you know, everything you're looking for. Then you go back six weeks later and he's no energy. Or, so in that, that's a very difficult age to, to scout between, I would say, 13 and 15. When they come to under 16, they start to fill out. They're starting to come out. You know, most players are, are starting to come out of the growth and maturation age uh, and start to gain a little bit of power to get their balance back. Uh, so... There's no uh, crystal ball. So what we try to do is, if a kid is talented at 11, 12, if he keeps himself good and he follows the curriculum, he'll come back at 16. There is players that just go through in a straight line, but most of them are up and down. And uh, for us, it's to keep keep faith with them you know, during the periods that are difficult for them in terms of their growth. And also, you know yourself, look like, at uh, in that age group, emotionally they change as well. You know, they've got other things in their mind, uh, school work, there'll be little pressures. Uh, and then, so we've got to support them in all different ways uh, and wait to see how they, how they develop. And every goal for every one of the kids that are in the system is when they're approaching 16, they want to be a pro. And that can breed a little bit of anxiety as well. So, like we've got a great coaching staff and, and a great way of working and we try to keep them now. Not everybody makes it through, but we're hoping whether they leave at under 16 or you know, during the 16 to 18, the youth team, if they ever leave the club, that they've got enough behind them that other clubs will want them. And if you look through, even like we spoke about Shane making his debut against uh, Ross County, uh, Ross County have had uh, a lot of Celtic players, even Michael Garden still there, uh, the, the lad Stuart as well. But you know, there's been Ryan Conroy and there have been many, many, Brock O'Quinn, there's been many up there. If you look through the leagues, you know, a success for our academy is not only the ones that we're bringing through to the first team, but the, the ones that's went through uh, and made a career at other clubs. Yeah, Willie, Tommy Johnson was on the show with us a couple of months ago and Tommy said, you know, because of the grounding a player gets at Celtic, clubs will be, if they become available, clubs will be very interested because of what they, the walk that has been already put into them. So he was yeah, even saying, if a player doesn't make it at Celtic, you know, it's still, 
they've still the grounding for a very good professional career. Well, it's, it's something that like, obviously we've worked hard that, and uh, like no, you know the style of play, like no, the curriculums there. The, the players are allowed to express themselves, play the Celtic way, and you play with a purpose. You play to try and win the match. You, you try to win your individual uh, test within the game. No, it's not. It's not a battle. You know, people refer that you know, to maybe senior football, but you've got the cat and mouse situation. Like you no, know, and that's where you see game intelligence. You know, when when young players are, are growing through that age group, and that that's, that happens right through. You no, know. the hardest part is uh, bridging the gap between potential and first team. And you know, thank God we've, we've been able to. Have, I think it's nineteen players now who have played not in the Champions League qualifiers in the Champions League group stages. So there's not many clubs uh, can say that from their academy. That's a great so, return. It is, and uh, you know, you know, there's other players going, and you know the, the recruitment that you're talking about. You know, we've been able to go and get Musa Dumbelli, you know, the first team scout, and then you, know, you mentioned Jeremy coming in, and that's a kind of hybrid one between you know, certain people like working at the club to to bring him in. And what I would say, like, you, know, you can't go into too much depth uh, on it, but I would say identifying a player is one thing, but recruiting the player. Is much harder, you know, and that's right through even even the, the younger age group. But you know, as a Celtic supporter, like there's players that you might like and say, "Oh, he should be at Celtic." But to try and get them, like, you no, know, you see the the money that's been spent in England, and I don't know if you've noticed that maybe six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, when we were looking for players as, as a club or other prices, there wasn't much moving and prices. Nobody knew what the price of a player would be. Now that the English Premier League, uh, as soon as that finished from last season, about four weeks ago, things have just gone up and up and up, uh, the value of the players now. And to get a striker anywhere, you know, you're looking at five to ten million. And the top players are, are up at 70, 80 million now. But, you know, that, that's the hardest thing that we have to do. Like, no, it's compete. You know, we can identify the players we might want. No, in the academy and moving up, but the hardest part of the job is recruiting them, get, getting things over the line. Yeah, well, just one player um, that I suppose played very young with Hamilton as a senior player was James McCarthy. Was he ever? Was he ever with Celtic? Or? Well, we, we, we spoke about him. Yeah, the, he was in for a trial period, but at that time, no, we've got great talents ourselves, and you can't sign everybody. Yeah. Uh, but no, I do remember him being in at that time. No, but there's, there's players that will be at other clubs who were in at Celtic, like no, as young kids, and no, they move on as well. Uh, but no, James has been on there for a good career. And a yeah. couple come in, leave, and then come back as senior players, like uh, Stephen Craney and Charlie McGrew. Yeah, yeah, they were a group of boys. Like when I was youth, youth team coach, head of youth, that we brought in talented boys. Talented boys. Uh, Charlie's still doing really well. Stephen, like uh, different players, uh, but there was a lot of good lads at that time. If, if you remember, like John Kennedy, like no the assistant manager at the moment. Like, well, John Kennedy, uh, Stephen McManus, they actually signed you know, on the same day, uh, and John was outstanding. You no, know, the potential that he had, and it was from 14, 15 years of age where we. At that time, that's when you could sign them on S forms, and uh, like John was in with us all the time. And thank God we we got him over the line because a big interest at that time from Man United. Uh, so that was a a big day for us as well. No signing the two boys, you know, at the same time. You must get great satisfaction when you see someone that's come through the underage with Celtic. It's everybody. I, I remember doing like oh, maybe team talks before the the Youth Cup final and. Like, uh, thank God, they, in the days we were, were there virtually every year and like winning it. And also, we were doing something right. Uh, although it's not all about winning, winning it's, uh, it's a quality to have at Celtic. And uh, like, just what you said about being proud, like, there's so many people uh, proud. Like, first of all, it's a big occasion for the boys, uh, their mums, their dads, uh, they're looking for you know, tickets for all the family. So that's something they've never handled before. 
prior to the game and with media attention, they've been interviewed you know, on Celtic TV and things like that. So it's it's different from the norm and it's a great experience for them. Uh, but you're talking about being proud. You know, how do the, the parents feel? You know, under 18, their kid started off trying to get signed with Celtic and they're through, they're playing in a cup final and you know, you know yourself, like, uh, if a, you have a good group, more get carried through to the next level. And that was something we always tried to preach to them. But it was a case of go and enjoy yourself. Go and, go and be proud of what you've done and go and make other people proud of you. And I would mention, like, no, right from the scouts, they're sitting there willing you on, like, no, the coaches that you've worked with all through the, all through the system. No, some of them have been from eight-year-old. You no, know, for ten years, all the coaches are there. They're all willing you on. They're all like, you no, know, looking for you to do well, and ultimately, go and show the manager what you can do, and on a big stage. Because the biggest jump is the, the lads playing youth football. You know, the managers come to see the talents and and whatever, but it's good to see them under pressure, and that was the thing he tried to put across to them: uh, go and enjoy, go and show people, go and make us. You know, the, your parents proud and there were so many people there supporting you uh, and have supported you over the years. So that was a kind of message to them and uh, like no the they were a good a good bunch and, and it goes in cycles. The years you get two or three good players, some you get six or seven that might move through. But the one thing is you wanted them to enjoy the experience as well uh, and never get them too uptight. Well, because that might be the last time they play in a Celtic jersey, because it's normally the, the last game of the season, you know, the cup final. So you want them to remember you know, that, that time and hopefully that they'll, the majority of them will move into the reserve team and towards the first team. But it should be a special time to be a Celtic player. It's always great for the fans, really, when a young player comes through the system, one of our own, as we say, and you know, we see them coming off the bench, or even when you check the team sheet, they're on it. And I don't mean the pre season friendlies, I mean when we're playing a competitive game. And when I think back, you know, you think back to Tony Watt coming off the bench, like you know, after Lona, like you know, no one, nobody knew who Tony was. And there's been so, so many other debuts where you see a player coming on and you're just like going. Well, the, one, the one I remember is uh, David Marshall, yes, yeah. like big John Kennedy played in that game as well. And he just grew from this potential and a man he was outstanding look he's still playing international football just now the current number one in Scotland uh, so things like that and I think within weeks he had a fantastic save at Ibrox you know, and, and, that, and that just makes you, you know, but the, there's a lot of, a lot of good lads uh, there and like you no, know, they've came through and there's actually that many the, the Celtic fans have always liked that you know, a way back to the the Kelly, Kelly kids, um, they know that I can remember. They know they always supported you. Uh, with my own experience as well, when you go into the team at first, they're just desperate for you to do well. You know, that's the same just now. You know, Mikey Johnson came in and you know, caught the eye with the boys as well, but he's had a few the supporters, sorry, as well, and uh, like, there's a few injuries. So, but there's you know, that's the stalwarts just now, James Forrest and Callum. Uh, they're just real leaders for for the team now, and uh, obviously Kean left last year and whatever. But part of seven he was and coming through from eight year old, and you know, as I said to you earlier on, we've got a framed jersey that Kean gave to my dad uh, for you know, to recognise like you know, he brought him into the club. And that's pride to place down you know, down in the, the main TV room uh, that the boys have got. So. He, he went for 25 million, so that's a kid that came in at eight year old. Uh, so, like, no, their success is in different ways, you know, and you just, from my point of view, the, the titles I've had itself have been head of youth and youth team coach, reserve team manager, and, and now here you, you, you want to be the best you can be as well. And basically, that's for the boys. You know, like it's to try and, I used to try and go and learn and bring things back from Europe and club visits I went to, to to help their development and it was amazing like the, the boys would take you know, like when you're working with young players it keeps you young because you've got to go on your toes they're as sharp as a tack <laughs> it'd be the Villarreal passing drill or 
a game and whatever. And I remember Ed McGeady at the player of the year impersonating me. Like, no, did he? Like, no, like this is if this is good enough for Villarreal, we go. No, it was good enough for you, that type of thing. And Bayer Leverkusen or Bayern Munich, whatever it may be. Uh, but they were a great bunch and, and, and really enjoyed my time uh, with the youth. And I, I'll tell you another wee story. They, they took us out into the city and I thought it was a wind-up. So it was going on for a day or two. Charlie McGrew was the, kind of the main man. The main man. Uh, so Ed McGeady and they're all, they're, all, they're all there. So they said, you're coming for a meal, we want to say thanks, blah, blah, blah. And like, okay, right. Uh, so I was training up at uh, Lennox Town and I'm driving home. Now I'm saying to myself when I'm driving home, will I meet them or will I not? And uh, anyway, the phone goes, where are you? Are you in the town yet? And this is Charlie. And I said, no, no, I'm going home for some clinic kill. Uh, go home for some, get changed. No, like I'll meet you in the town later. Right, okay, but well, we're in such and such a place. We'll be in Glasgow and an hour. No, make sure you're there. You've, you've got to come. And I'm like, right, okay. If this is a wind up, I'm going to go. <laughs> but if it's a wind up, I'll take it in good, good faith and whatever. And if it's if it's real, then brilliant. But <laughs> I go, go down, get the train. I'm heading in. The phone goes, Charlie, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You're in the town yet? No, he says, right. Meet us, meet us underneath the guy with the cone in his head at Royal Oaks James Square. Now that's what he said. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, I'm on the train. I'd as well get the train back because this is a wind up. So <laughs> again, into the central. And uh, the last thing I'm going to do is go and stand underneath <laughs> the statue, right? So uh, again, to Royal Oaks James Square. And I went into the toilet in one of the pubs. And there they all came trooping in, right? And they couldn't believe I was there. They thought I wasn't coming. But the moral of this story is that they wanted to say thanks, but they must be talking all the time amongst themselves. All the boys, some of them had left the club, some of them were still there. They went with that and put, bang, a piece of paper on the table and asked me to write down each position, who was the best player to come through the youth and through your ranks. So anyway, and this is what triggered me off to tell the story was David Marshall. So I sat with goalkeeper and I'm going, and I'm trying to be a wee bit cheeky to him, you know, Scott Fox, great goalkeeper. Big Marsh, outstanding. Hugh McGovern, he's just played in the World Cup in Northern Ireland and whatever. Uh, Andy McCondick, he got through, Barry John Corr. So the amount of time you spent just in the goalkeepers, that came through it was frightening so we ended up like no close one have to put Marsh in uh, Foxy like, no Michael all done great so we said right what about the back four so Charlie's the, 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 no, the he's uh, the ringleader like he's the one that's doing all the chirping so right backs we're going for Paul Caddis uh, like no there was another list there right centre back Kendall left centre back and Charlie's getting chirpy. So I'm like, well, okay, uh, down the day, uh, there's uh, Stephen McManus, club captain, it's going to be Stephen McManus and Charlie's got all agitated, <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's like, oh, you put me in at left back, Willie? And I said, Charlie, Stephen Kenny was a better left back than you. Like, <laughs> right? And he's like, what? I said, look, you might make the bench. So at that time, Right, the whole place is erupting. Right, so Charlie being the you know the the Jack the Lad and the one that wanted it all done. Right, I knew what he was up to, so it was easy to leave him at the team. He was on the bench, <laughs> 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 but that that that's what they were like. And, and for me, it was, uh, like it was a great a great time. Uh, you know, to be a coach as well. You know, working with the, the boys and. Uh, like thoroughly enjoy that. You've named some plenty of talented players there. Uh, that's all, that's me only getting to the back four because Ross and, Wallace and this is, go back as well. But yeah. this is probably an unfair question because really I think there's another episode in your best team you brought through. Yeah, and Andrew, it's not me bringing them through. It's no, system, but right? no, but when you're the coach as well, you know, and of course the great, great Tommy Bones was there with you and you know there's so many brilliant coaches. But just from your perspective, 
you know, the players that come through with you, you know, could you pick one out, you know, and you went, he, he, he's the most talented or he's the best, without being unfair? You, you, you know yourself, it's like, uh, who's the best player in Celtic's first team just now? Like, no, it's, uh, it's different qualities for different positions. No, but natural talent and ability, like, no, I'm sure the boys wouldn't have mind the saying, like, no. But I'll readdress that. I way back when I, when I first came in, the first team that I was handed over, there was a, the young lad, John Paul McBride. Uh, he was competing against Barry Ferguson at that particular time. And for me, John Paul had everything. But just things happen uh, in life and, like, no opportunity opportunity like he went to St John's I think he made a couple of games for us as well but he went to St John's and like uh, no difference but he was a natural footballer in possession and out of possession he, he just was outstanding and then when you go through it there was many many talented boys and when you're looking at individual skills like Ed McGeady would be up there with the, the best you know, in, in terms of the uh, he was a talent, very much like Paul in a lot of ways. Like, no, from eight year old, you no know, people were raving about him being a like a, a top class player. Now that that's hard to handle at times, and and he did it. He handled, he'd done it all the way through, uh, and he's still playing now. So, you know, fair fair play. I mean, he's you know, done brilliant for Celtic, went to other clubs, and a real talent uh, as well. But at that age group, you know, he could do it. And, like, no, he had the attitude as well, you know, to, you know, to go with it. it. It was just, you know, the desire to always be the best. And some players there, Willie, really, that you named, um, it's, it's, uh, I actually memories are floating back to certain games as well now. And, and <laughs> when you said Big Marsh there in Barcelona. And, but you, you know, look, you look at that time as well, Andrew, like, uh, so you said, you no, know, like, I came in, Tommy was manager, you no, know, with Billy Stark. I come back from Sligo from, Winning that treble, uh, and it was just a great, a great time. But it was difficult because the first season was uh, at Hamden, you know, for for Tommy and the team and all that. And like uh, you know, what happened after that? I lost one game uh, in a season, uh, the following season, and, and never won the league. Uh, so then there was all the different managers that came in, you know, with them and Doctor Joe and like. Martin, like no, it's just uh, you know, the experience that you were getting from all, all these guys. It was uh, a great time to be there in that capacity that I had. Uh, and then, latterly, you no, know, like Tommy came back after leaving the club, you know, and working in the youth as well. And he just what a man. That's all I can say. What a man. Tommy's legacy is, you know, it's there for all to see. Like, uh, I suppose, like the next day is. No, Tommy was Celtic through and through. No, oh, definitely, yeah. He, was, uh, he didn't do anything half-hearted, that's for sure. Like, uh, at the time where he, he went back into the, the lower academy, like, uh, I remember being at a game and I came by the London Road and the lights were on at Barrowfield. It was nearly 10 o'clock at night. And my first thing, first thought was, Tommy's down the night. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the midnight mid Tommy. The, the, the wee grounds when, you know, when Tommy came in he'd he, be phoning up the road saying like I'm going to be late tonight Tommy's in <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you know. Tommy would have done anything for Celtic wouldn't he uh, he's, he's just a great man uh, knowledgeable passionate uh, a, a good man and he was the type of guy that uh, you no know, didn't matter how close you were to him like no he, he could like no, in a way, like tell you, no, you need to do this. I need to do that. Uh, but also, like you could uh, make you feel ten foot tall. He just had a, a great charisma about him. Uh, in fact, even when he was trying to knock you, he left you, you no, know, feeling ten foot tall as well. Then yes, you go back. All right, I've got the message there, right, but you feel good. <laughs> and Neil had that as well. No, you, you can yeah. not say much, but no, make you. Like feel good about yourself, but reflect on the message. Yeah, Scott McDonald said when he came to Celtic first, he went away on pre-season, I think, and he said, Tommy came over to him and put his arm around him and said, you're one of us, you're one of our players and you're good enough. And he said the lift that gave him was, because mm -hmm. no, there was a lot of competition for places and obviously he was coming with the history he was coming with. But he said Tommy was just brilliant. And that kind of comes across with most of the players that I speak to about Tommy. 
William X. Day, Celtic true and true, and once again we had to let the tape run and run as the conversation flowed, and you can hear the second part of the interview with Willie on Tuesday's show. 19 years since we started more than 90 minutes, and issue 110 goes on sale today. You can order the print or digital copy. If you order the print, we'll get it posted out straight away, and if you can't wait, the digital will drop straight into your inbox. You can order both on our website. Thanks, as always, to our producer, Ronan McQuillan. If you like what we're doing and would like to support us, you can do so by visiting CelticFanzine.com, where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a point. Thanks to everyone who has listened and supported us so far. We really appreciate the support. Thanks to everyone who has downloaded the new app. It's free and you will have access to all our podcasts, articles, daily news, video and info on upcoming events, the fanzine and our online shop, all at the touch of a button. All episodes of the podcast are now available on all platforms, so whatever your preferred platform is, please hit the subscribe or follow button and you'll never miss an episode. If you click into our Instagram, you'll also be able to go on straight onto Spotify where you can get all the episodes. And I'd like to thank Aaron for looking after our Instagram account. We would also appreciate if you could hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV. We are currently working on some new video material and we'll have that out soon. Thanks again to our episode sponsor, Left Wing Badges, who produce all our badges and are a great way for fundraising for your CSC. If you'd like to see our badges, you can visit our shop at celticfanzine.com forward slash shop. You'll also see all our t-shirts and merchandise. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club are enjoying the podcast and would like to help us out and become a sponsor, please email us at info at celticfanzine.com. You can also contact us through the website or through social media. Keep the comments coming in and let us know what guests you would like us to get on the show. And if you have a story to tell, please get in contact. And I'd like to thank the listener who contacted us about getting Willie on the show. I really enjoyed chatting to him. And you can get the second part, episode 29, with Willie in conversation with us on Tuesday. Enjoy your weekend. Let's hope the boys can do the business against Livingston tomorrow. And we can celebrate going top of the table with a few drinks. Stay tuned, stay safe and keep the faith.